Scientology so afraid of. This, this is SPTV. Went with the old school SPTV intro this time. Guys, I'm joined today by former Scientology Sea Org member, Mike Brown. How's it going, man? It's going well, Aaron. Thanks for having this me. A, this conversation has been a long time in the coming. Yeah. Yes, it long has. time in the I'm making. Glad I can finally. Yeah. Yeah. Can't put this it is, off any longer. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, so, oh my God, there, there's so much ground that we're going to cover today. It's, it's hard to know where to actually begin, but let's, let's begin. Let's begin by explaining who you are. Uh, by the way, by the way, um, you guys might've seen Mike Brown last night on with Mike Render and Claire Headley. They were talking about, uh, Mike and his mom. Uh, I always get, I, do I say, I say Rosemary or Rosemary. Oh, oh, I always say her name. I always pronounce Ro her name. Wrong. Rosemary. Yeah, Rosemary. Rosemary. I always <laughs> so she, yeah, so she has a couple names that we'll kind of go over. Everyone in the C organization that would have known her from um, International Management or Golden Era Productions would have known her as Rosemary Brown. Later, she was forced to change her name when she was on the RPF and PAC, and she changed it back to her maiden name, Rosemary Chickwalk. And we'll get into some specifics about that. So people who knows her, know her as Rosemary Chickwalk probably recognize this person right here. Um, people who know her as Rosemary Brown probably recognize her a little more like that. Um, and so the reason you know you, that you were talking about your mom and her whole story um, on on Mark and Claire's channel is the Aftermath Foundation helped you help your mom escape from the C organization, and. And your mom had an unbelievable amount of documentation about the abuse and uh, 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 you know, and financial abuse that elderly Sea Org members are being subjected to in Los Angeles. And uh, it's it's unbelievable. It's Staggering. almost yeah. hard hard to even describe. But that's what you started doing with Mike and Claire last night. You guys are, I believe, going to finish that story tomorrow night. Um, we're not trying to necessarily rehash all of that here. Uh, we're going to rehash some of it, but I want to start out sure. by telling everyone who you are. How do you describe who you are in your Scientology experience? So I am a uh, second generation Scientologist. My parents got into Scientology um, in Colorado when I was seven years old. Uh, this would have been probably 1985, 1986. And, um, I remember that vividly when, like when LRH died in, uh, 86, I kind of distinctly remember that in my head because it was the event that all of, it was kind of televised to all the orgs. But, um, my, my father, uh, was a former Vietnam veteran and he would go from self-help thing to self-help thing, trying to get relief from PTSD. And he was on a Scientology kick when my parents got divorced. Um, my mother ended up then as a single mother she joined the C organization when I was 10 years old, moved to Los Angeles. I then grew up uh, in the C org um, in Los Angeles, then ended up being moved up to the, uh, the Ant ranch after Rosemary um, moved up to Ant. Uh, she was in uh, the senior executive strata worked for Ronnie Miscavige after there's a lot to go over with the Ant ranch and we can, you know, poke around in that a little bit today or save it for another day. But eventually I ended up working at Golden Era Productions. Um, I worked there for many, many years. Um, I was um, a fixture in the organization around the same time that Mark Headley was. And in 2003, I then um, blew, um, started my life from scratch. And there's a lot of circumstances that uh, lead up to that. But I then leave. And when I left, Rosemary stayed working at Golden Era Productions and at the Ent Base. And I left and went and started my life um, with nothing more than a GED that I was able to kind of get on the sly um, and not any sort of credit record or money and had to figure out what I wanted to do. I kind of knew what I wanted to do because early on I wanted to leave the Sea Org and join the military, but I was unable to. And, um, and I had to just basically start over and I, every, my family that I knew both friends and direct family, which was my former wife and my mother all 
disconnected from me um, because I left. Um, there's no such thing as staying in contact with family if you leave the Sea Org, especially if you leave the Sea Org at the international base. Mm. So I was declared a suppressive person. I actually have, I am an actual card carrying like goldenrod copy. We'll have to review it sometime because it's a lot of fun. Um, I wear my SP bracelet, which is a lot of fun. And I refer to myself as SP number 12595 because that is my flag conditions order of my SP declare. Oh my God. I love it. <laughs> you have the actual goldenrod issue declaring you a suppressive person. Complete with Mike Ellis's shitty little signature on it. Yes. Wow. I never <laughs> had that honor. They, they, Scientology still to this day has never informed me officially that I'm declared a suppressive person. They just informed everybody else. <laughs> I think we can all assume that it is the case at this point. Though. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> So then, so you leave the Sea Org in tw uh, 2003. How did you blow? blow oh, for, and for anyone who's not, blow in Scientology is a word that means you basically, you leave without permission, you go, you go AWOL. Mm -hmm. How did you, how did you do that? How old were you at the time? So I was 27 years old. Um, I was on, um, I was in the manufacturing division of Golden Era Productions. And I was, my job required that I would go out and do manufacturing and specifically um, press, meaning like printing of books. I was also connected in with the, there was a, a Church of Spiritual Technology mission being run by Russ Bellin and a couple people under him where they were designing all of the new basic books, the new um, packaging, the CD packaging, the new meter was being designed. And while they would have designs being done, they would need the prototyping done. So as these production lines were generating the prototypes for these new products, like Sterling would be working with the artist, creating the art for it. I would then take that art and go and actually make a final prototype for it to get submitted. So I would be off the base doing that, uh, that, doing that stuff routinely. I was out for one of those things following a very unfortunate conversation that I had with my then wife, um, Samantha, uh, where she had a bad run in with David Miscavige and he screamed at her. She was a makeup artist at Golden Era Productions, um, and he was getting his hair cut and didn't like something about it. So, of course, he's going to yell at staff. Anyway, she comes home one night, um, and the working conditions are just like everyone is usually described. It's you're working around the clock. You're getting treated like crap. You don't get paid. It's, it's horrible. But they keep people there because of familial connections. And, you know, a lot of people are also there because they kind of believe in Scientology, even though they don't probably believe in the current leader of it. So she came home one night and just said, I can't take it. I want out of here. Um, I want to blow, which is like we said, that's the unauthorized departure of going AWOL. And I was like, oh, thank God, let's get the hell out of here. Um, we had been through in the time that we had been married, um, two periods where she had become pregnant. And when you're, when you become pregnant in the Sea Org, you're not allowed to keep the baby. Um, either that or they'll kick you out on the street. It's you're, you're put in an impossible situation, but, um, uh, families that are put in that situation are forced or pressured to terminate the pregnancy, uh, without getting into the exact words, because I know YouTube's a little sensitive about that. We had been through all that. Um, I was way past the point of wanting to be there, but I was there because my family was there. Um, her can, her response when I shared like, I'm ready to go with her. She thought about it and she was like, I'm just going to end up coming back. Um, we're going to end up getting divorced if this happens. Uh, we, we can't leave. <clears throat> that was a big thing for me to hear uh, because she was probably really the only reason I was still staying there. Her, her extended family, um, her mother's cousin is Rena Weinberg, who's the head of ABLE. Um, her, her parents, like her whole family's in Scientology. She, she doesn't have family outside of Scientology. So hmm. for her, it was a very impossible situation. I don't, I don't fault her for her decision, but it really made it clear to me that my understanding of our relationship was very different from hers. So it was, it was very spur of the moment. It wasn't like I crafted in my mind, okay, I'm going to go out for this print job. And I was pretty much done with it sitting in the car. I was one of the few people at Golden Air Productions that could drive having done car school. <laughs> and uh that's ridiculous um and i'm just sitting in the car after this print run and i'm just like i can't go back there and i just said on a whim decided to drive straight to um ontario airport in southern california buy a one-way ticket to where i knew family was in colorado and 
leave without even contacting that family. I didn't even know where they lived anymore or have phone numbers. It was like, I'll figure it out when I get there. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of very interesting story with that, but I left with no money and no plan of what to do other than when I was a young child at the Ant Ranch, I wanted to leave and wasn't able to, um, which there's a lot of details to get in with that, which I think we, uh, we should probably make a whole separate video about the Ant Ranch. Um, but I wanted to join the military. Um, so I left and I'm 27 years old with like no credit record, no, nothing, no, very little education. Um, and I had to start my life from scratch. So I, I came out at 27. I had to quickly figure out what to do. I went and did all the testing for the military. I tested very high, but not having a, uh, a formalized education kind of limits what jobs you can get in the military. They're, they're kind of more entry level positions, uh, junior enlisted kind of positions, but I scored quite high on all the testing that they did. Went in the military, <clears throat> spent a, uh, several years in the military, did one deployment to Iraq. And uh, through that was able to apply for officer training went to officer can or warrant officer candidate school became a helicopter pilot in uh, 2007 and since then i've had multiple deployments in both iraq and afghanistan i'm coming up on about 20 years of time in the military um, um, as a helicopter pilot and instructor pilot and i've i've pretty much i've i've kind of followed my dream um, but at the same time i left an entire life behind me to include a lot of people that I kill, care very much about, um, both friends and family or former family. And m my mother was the, one of the main people that I left behind and we had no real contact. She had to disconnect from me. I still have those letters from her. Um, and uh, I was under the impression the entire time I left that she, she was in the place she wanted to be, which isn't necessarily untrue but it doesn't mean that she was well taken care of. And it definitely doesn't mean that she was happy. She was stuck in a situation that she didn't know how to get out of and believed in Hubbard, uh, even though she was being badly abused. So that that's more or less my story, um, you know, in a nutshell. Um, but there's a lot. Sorry, I'm getting that cotton mouth thing that you talk about when you talk too much. But, uh, there's a lot that um, that I found out more recently in terms of what my mother was subjected to, both while she was um, prior to being a senior uh, citizen in the Sea Organization, and then once she became a senior citizen, um, how the organization absolutely took advantage of her. And it, and, and it's not unique to her, like the things that I've found out about, this isn't a, this isn't a, a, a pure occurrence. That's only Rosemary Chickwalk. This is, this is dozens and dozens of old people that she is simply a microcosm of this is. So the sharing the story is not only important so people understand what was done to her, but there's a lot of people that are still there. And the majority, I would say probably greater than 50 to 60% of the population of the Sea Organization of Scientology is rapidly approaching what would be normally considered a retirement age. And there's no such thing as retirement in the C organization. The, there aren't as many people joining, or if they do join, they end up leaving. Any second and third generation Scientology, the attrition rate on us is pretty high because it was never our decision to be there. And at some point we're like, this is stupid, I need out, and we leave. Um, the only ones that are there are the ones that at some point decided to go, and they're badly taking advantage of those people. Yeah. Um, I meant to show everyone when we started, but it's just as appropriate right now. Uh, Mike is going to be doing a lot of things with his, uh, his own YouTube channel moving forward. And you can find him at Mike Brown. And if it doesn't show up under Mike Brown, just search this handle at Mike Brown 101 and, uh, you'll have no trouble finding it. So, uh, just real quick, just to get, uh, for the you know for the under the radar people scientology people watching you will recognize rosemary uh, tell everyone what, what years she was in los angeles uh, working on l ron hubbard way at the advanced organization of los angeles absolutely so at about 2012 <clears throat> she um went to work at aola and she was in the public division as the extension course supervisor 
Okay. She was in that position for almost a decade. So anyone in the last 10 years who has done an extension course after they've re-released all of these basic books and all of the different lectures that they're having people do extension courses for, Rosemary has been the one that you've been um, having correspondence with that has been grading your extension courses for a decade. <clears throat> now, I suspect that much of what your mom went through at international management, working with Ronnie Miscavige and, and others at the International Management Executive Committee. I imagine you guys have gone into that a little bit already on Mike and Claire's um, chat. Yeah, we went into it in quite a bit of detail. Okay. Um, I could well, summarize it a little bit if you'd like me to. I'll tell you where, where I think I'd um, like to start just as far as the conversation about your mom. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Help the people understand, because you left the Sea Org, you were declared, you were a military guy, you still are a military guy. How did it come to be that you ended up helping your mom escape? Um, in, it was that a person has to get to the point of almost dying in order for the Sea Org to actually let their extended family know. And this would only be family members that are actually not declared a suppressive person. How, um, what the condition of their loved one is. So for instance, she has a lot of family that live in Ohio that have never been in Scientology. They all grew up Catholic there. She has like nine brothers and sisters. And at a certain point, so none of them have ever been involved in Scientology. So Scientology would still communicate with them if she was on her deathbed to let someone know, hey, your loved one is dying or if somebody had a heart attack, which are really the only times that the organization has ever really allowed communication is when she has been hospitalized to a point of almost incapacitation. Um, that's really the only time you're going to get communication. And it's through one of these calls to her sister, who then related to me, that I was able to kind of find out that she was in this situation. And then um, be able to start taking action to move out there and figure out what's going on. People that are in the Sea Org, when they move away from a former member that is no longer in good standing, it's it's like if if someone gets shunned in another religion. Everyone turns their back on them. They refuse to communicate with you. So even if they want to talk to you, they think that there's a spiritual reason why they have to push you away in hopes that you will come back to them. It's it's a very similar thing that's been played out in multiple different religions and cults. Um, but Scientology, quite frankly, they, they could care less if someone dies. Um, for them, like this this reality and this life is very immaterial. And they just, uh, especially when you get to these old people, they start to become a bit of a, a drain on the organization and they would prefer that they just go away. There's a lot of stories Rosemary has shared with me where like old Sea Org members up into their late age, like there was one lady, she was 92 years old. She had worked there and came home at 10 o'clock at night, just like all the old people do into the little room that they have as a dormitory on the second floor of the main building, room 206, if anyone's uh, interested in raiding the place and finding out it's an old mechanical room that they put a bunch of bunk beds in and put old people into. She came in and she was dying. And what they won't do is they won't call emergency services. So when this person's like, oh, I, I think I'm dying, the normal response would be, let me call 911. Not, not for the Sea Org. They will find a car, put the person in it, drive them to the hospital that's a block away, drop them at the ER, and they'll die alone. Um, because no family will be there. These people are just working for the organization. It's, it's appalling. Um, but the only reason I found out about her situation was because she was that bad off. And um, in the video tomorrow with um, Claire and Mike, we'll go into the steps that the foundation helped me um, to figure out and the entire like, you know, mission to go in there and kind of get her out of that once she was ready to. But originally when somebody is in that situation and you walk into the hospital as a family member, you'll have their medical representative who's kind of just a liaison. They're not a nurse or a doctor. They're just the person who kind of drives people to and from appointments if they ever get appointments. 
that's kind of chaperoning them. They have medical power of attorney. Scientology has complete control of all these family members. You, they, the family and next to Ken do not. And if you show up, you're still kind of in this disconnected, shunned situation where, you know, she's really glad to see me, but at the same time, concerned that she'll get in trouble if she shows any affection. And um, it's it's horrible as the person receiving that, be kind of being on the receiving end of disconnection. But for the people that are there, like it it removes any connection that they have to the outside real world. And then they're just stuck even deeper. And the only thing they have to rely on is then that organization to take care of them. Right. So you said that the way you found out about her situation, what exactly was her situation? Like, what did it get to that, that, that you found out about it? And was it through family members you found out about it? It was for, uh, through her, uh, through my aunts and uncles. Um, non so she was non-Scientologist. Um, yeah. yeah, they, they, they got a hold of me because when I left, I was able to reconnect with all of my family that I really grown up never knowing because I was in the Sea Org and you just don't visit family when you're in the Sea Org, you just work all the time, every day, all the time. So, um, I was then in contact with them and, um, my aunt and my uncle reached out to me and said, Hey, your mother looks like she's going to pass away. She's, uh, we got a call from them. It looks like she had a stroke and she's going to die. She hadn't had a stroke. Um, what she did have was, uh, extreme dehydration and she needed uh, supplemental oxygen in, in, in 20, 2011, she had triple bypass surgery and the circumstances leading up to that are extreme as well, but she had triple bypass surgery. And after that triple bypass surgery, she never was given medical follow-ups unless she had like a recurrence of a condition that she needed medical treatment. But there wasn't like, she didn't have a cardiologist. She wasn't going and getting regular examinations. She didn't have a pulmonologist. She needed all these things and didn't have them. She didn't have a walker. She didn't have supplemental oxygen. She was still being worked from early in the morning until late at night, you know, she, th these are old people and that's the way that she was being worked. And at a certain point, she just, her oxygen level was so low. She ended up, she had very bad pneumonia. So fluid had built up on her lungs. It was going untreated and her oxygen level was tanking down into the low eighties and she just couldn't stay conscious. So they drove her over to the hospital, to the emergency room and dropped her off and was, were expecting her to die. But a strange thing happened when she was given medicine, oxygen, food, and rest as she started to get better. Uh, she had a long recovery period after that, but that was the point it got to and before family was notified. And we were only notified because she was expected to die and they thought she had a stroke. She had been in and out of the hospital at different times over the years and no one was told. Um, but it was just like, oh. Ah, she looks like she's going to live still. Okay, bring her back. Um, but when it's like, oh, we're done with her. Let's let's notify next of kin. And let them know that where they can come and pick up a body. I know I'm being a little morbid about it, but it's about that bad. Um, yeah. There's there's very little humanity connected with the way that they treat their elderly. It's bad. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share it. So you you found out they'd send her off to one of the uh, to a house where they send Seerg members that they believe are going to die so that they don't die on the base. Yeah, they put her in hospice eventually, but she was first in, that's only when she was, uh, had spent about a, a month, uh, a month to 45 days between an intensive care ward and a rehab floor of the actual hospital as an inpatient. And eventually she was sent out to an old faci uh, facility that was off, um, the campus there at the, the, at, um, down L. Ron Hubbard way, that big cedar cyanide complex. Right. They sent her off of that, not. And the reason why they did that was not necessarily for her benefit, although it did benefit her. The reason they take people that are that bad off medically and they move them off the property is because they don't want the liability of having to call emergency services if someone drops dead on their premises. They wouldn't. They don't want to call EMTs. They don't want, um, you know. They don't want first responders and people that should be uh, mandatory reporters for health and for uh, welfare to be in a situation where they have to come in and see the living conditions that people have that are living there in, in all the different buildings down there in Los Angeles. So they moved her into this hospice facility and just were expecting her to die. Right. 
Do you remember the month and year you helped her escape? Um, it was March, uh, 2021, 2021. So two and a half years ago, sorry, March, 2022, 2021 is when we started to find out the specifics of what we talked about and the pro and the, the entire thing of, uh, getting her out of there took the better part of 10 months between getting her in a frame of mind of wanting to leave and then figuring out how to get her out without. Mm -hmm someone getting the wiser that she wants to leave and then moving her to somewhere where we couldn't find her. Yeah. It's only been 18 months since you helped her escape. It feels like it's been so much longer. <laughs> I know. And in that time, we di I didn't know nearly the extent of the abuse that she was subjected to when we got her out. It was only after we got her out and we I was able to get uh, her there and help her get copies of all our financial records. She had a ledger where she kept track of all this stuff. But getting copies of all of the um, <clears throat> invoices, the bank statements, the credit cards, the credit card statements, applications, the amount of data collection that's because, and it wasn't like I was going into it trying to find this stuff out, but she started telling me these stories and I was like, wait. And anytime I thought that I had gotten to the bottom of it, it's like, you know, like Vince from Sham Well, wait, there's more. And you just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. And it's just to the point of like, I need to start organizing this up and it turned into months of researching out what was going on with her yeah i do want to tell your viewers because this could possibly be a question all of the information that has been provided both uh, with claire and mike to the aftermath foundation of what we're talking <clears throat> about here has been provided to law enforcement like the the information that i'm talking about there is nothing here that we are you know, letting out of the bag for the first time. This is the first time we're, I'm publicly talking about it and we're going live about it, actually sharing it. But law enforcement is fully aware of this, um, just so that there's no question like, oh my God, you need to tell law enforcement. We have. Yeah. You mentioned Vince from ShamWow. You know that guy was a Scientologist, right? <laughs> yeah, I thought it was appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so can you... Um, briefly i don't care if it's brief but we don't have to go into every excruciating detail explain to them what you learned what your mom shared about how the elderly sea Org members who scientology knows only have a few years left at, at most how they are exploited financially yeah it's um <clears throat> it for the people listening to this for the first time you're you're going to get progressively more upset as i talk about this i'm just letting you know so <clears throat> for this, I'll try to just tell a little bit of a story on how, how Rosemary ended up in the situation she was in. She was on the rehabilitation project force um, after she got uh, offloaded from the international base. And this is uh, the, and the, the circumstances surrounding it is she was basically sent to that thought reconditioning camp as, uh, as, her former employer and executive, um, Ronnie Miscavige Jr., it's David Miscavige's slightly older brother, she was his secretary. And he was involved in um, sexual assault, and she was very much a victim working for him. She was his assistant. And it's, you know, he would be demanding back rubs. There was inappropriate touching. And this this went on for a very long time. When it was found out about... Um, she was the one who got investigated. She was the one that was punished. Um, she was still kept up there on that property for about five years working for them up at Golden Era Productions, the international base, not directly for Miscavige, but as one of the, uh, <clears throat> the service people that uh, helped uh, take care of uh, VIPs. Uh, Mitch Brisker knows Rosemary very, very well. Uh, she took care of him for many years, took care of the late Danny Sherman. At a certain point, um, they were doing a clean out of the whole int base and she was sent to the RPF. And the reason for it was, well, because this happened, you committed um, out 2D, which is Scientology's um, phraseology for inappropriate sexual relations with Ronnie Miscavige. She didn't ever have any relations like that with him. And anything that did happen was not consensual. It was him doing things to her, demanding things that she was unable to say no to. He was kept in his position until many years later, he decided to then uh, blow and leave. But she was punished for that and sent to the rehabilitation project force. She spent six years 
on in that thought reconditioning camp in Los Angeles, restricted to that property, having to run everywhere that she went. When she went onto the program, she was about 59 years old. She didn't get off of it until she was almost 65. During that time, she was having extreme chest pain, a lot of uh, angina, uh, shortness of breath. She was having a little mini heart attacks. While she was on the RPF, she got no medical care for that, was just made to hurry up and run like everybody else, even though she couldn't keep up. And eventually she ended up graduating and got off of it. When she got off of it, she was made the cleaner for the main mess, because that's what you do with a little 90 pound old woman that's 65 years old is you make her clean a massive room of about a, where a thousand people eat their meals three times a day. She couldn't keep up with that and ended up having a heart attack. Um, they ended up taking her to county hospital. She got triple bypass surgery after the surgery. Um, because she was 65, she had, uh, some of my cousins had helped her sign up for Medicare. So she would, she qualified and had medical Medicare and she was starting to get social security payments from the government. Um, those were starting to accumulate little by little <clears throat> because she had money in her account. She didn't qualify for what would be uh, Medi-Cal or Medicaid, which is the the supplemental insurance that covers all your co-pays when you're a poor person. This mm -hmm. is what Scientology and the Sea Org do with all their Sea Org members, is they have them sign up for all of the healthcare plans from the federal government because they're not paying for medical for these people. That's like, right. why would they? They can have the government do it because, you know, everyone's poor. They don't pay them. They're religious volunteers. They don't have to pay for their medical. That's right. Scientology so she, does not pay for health insurance for its Sea Org members. No, it does. 100% does not. They only pay them $50 a week and they give them very little else. So she gets this triple bypass surgery. She is then stuck with the, she has a little bit of money in her account, probably about $10,000 that she was starting to accumulate from social security. Um, because she has that money in her account, she doesn't qualify for the supplemental insurance. So she's made to pay for the copay. Mm. The financial planning for the organization did not pay for that. So it came in, it was like, this needs to be covered. There's like, there's no money, sorry. So she had to pay for that. That should have been paid by her employer, you would think. They did not. When she was trying to recover post-op with the surgery, we're talking triple bypass surgery. They crack open your chest. You are, the, the, <clears throat> the amount of recovery is not really as much from the heart surgery as much as it's from recovering from the fact that they have to open you up the way that they do. For her, that was a lot. And she did not have any medical care um, when she was moved back into that main building at the complex. She was put up on the seventh floor, was there most of the day by herself, did not have any medical attendant helping her. She was cold. The room didn't have heat. It was in November and she was infrequently brought food. She, when she describes this to me, it's like she thought she was going to die. She's like, it was the, the most agony that she's ever been in in her entire life. Um, there was a medical assistant, um, a guy named John Bond. Uh, as an older guy, I think he worked with the MLO, like driving people to and from appointments on occasion. And he saw her and said, I've started to get some auditing. And she's like, oh my God, if I could get some auditing and hopefully get up to clear. She's been in the Sea Org for like 25 years at this point. She hasn't moved up the bridge at all from when she was a public Scientologist. And then she was very, very new to Scientology at the time. She had it in her mind, if she could get some auditing, it would help everything that was going on. <clears throat> so John Bond's son, a guy named Emmett Bond, he was one of the regs at ASHO, came over to Rosemary, this is Thursday before two o'clock, and had her write him a check for $10,000 so she could get some auditing from, in order to help her repair her body after her heart surgery. The auditing mainly consisted of objective processes, which you've talked a little bit about on your show, and assists. Wow. These are things that people should get for free. And two notes, Sea Org members are supposed to receive all their training and auditing as part of their employment. That wasn't happening. What was the justification for having her pay for auditing? Did she want it? What was it so that what was it um was it wrapped up in this thing of our auditors need to be generating these particular stats and they only get those stats if you've paid for the mm -hmm. auditing. So if you pay for the auditing, right. we'll give you an auditor. But if you don't, we don't have any to spare. Yeah. I'm being a little tongue in cheek about it just because it's like, hey, if you want it, you're going to have to pay for it. Their staff should be being receiving the benefits of Scientology. That's the whole reason like I'm going to join the C organization and be an OT when I grow up. Like, OK, well, the implied task is 
like to provide that person Scientology. They very rarely, if ever, do. So there's not enough auditors to barely handle the public needs. And um, there's not that many public. So if a staff member really wants to get it, especially when they're older, there's a lot of people that if they have inheritances, if they want to move up the bridge, they'll get them to pay for the auditing. Um, it does get way worse than this. So she was made to pay for that auditing that she should, and it was just things that she should have gotten as a matter of course of her employment. She never did, but they did give her that auditing. But in order to get her that auditing, they had to like, Hey, let's get her cleaned up. Let's, you know, get her some food. Let's start getting her up and about. And then getting her out of that room, getting her moving around. She started feeling better. Like, you know, when you take care of someone and they get some fresh air, especially as they're recovering, they're going to get better. Um, I don't, I don't really, I'm not trying to discuss if the auditing helped or if it didn't help the matter, what, what they should have done was help her any way that they could. And they only did that if they were able to take the money from her as GI and then deliver whatever services they made her buy so that they could get their paid completion statistics for the week. Yeah. It's just, let's get the money. Let's, let's deliver it to you. So we make our stats go up. And, and that was GI, kind of the focus GI, of and GI doing. is, uh, just for the viewers, GI is gross income, which is one of the number one stats of an organization, Scientology org. Yeah. So then after that, um, I had been able to go out there for a very short time because I was in Afghanistan, uh, on a, one of my deployments when she had the heart surgery, I was informed again by the same brothers and sisters that informed me later of this happening. I was released by my chain of command to travel back to see her. And I arrived back a day or two after her heart surgery. She was in the intensive care ward, uh, the cardiac intensive care ward. And along with her were the medical liaison officers, their handlers. And I was never left alone with her at any time. So I was able to get her a burner cell phone, one of these little prepaid things and I gave it to her before I left. And I put my phone number in it just because I wanted to contact her. The, and one thing I just want to help everyone understand the, the mic of today is very different than the mindset of the mic of yesteryear. So me at that time, this is the first time I had ever been back to Los Angeles when she was, had her, uh, her heart surgery since I blew. I had had no connection to anything Scientology related in about seven, seven and a half years. Going back into that environment was extremely disorienting. Um, this is, you know, a, a, a place that I was very conditioned as a child to listen to these people, like just the statement of what would LRH do, which is like the Scientology equivalent of what would Jesus do? But I'll tell you for a Scientologist, it has a lot more weight than that. Like there's, there's a level of programming that's almost, <laughs> anyway, go ahead. I was gonna, when, when I got out of the Sea Org and I started seeing what would Jesus do stickers on the bumper stickers, Mike, I thought they stole our thing. <laughs> yeah, that's where it came from. I was like, <laughs> they stole our shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What would Ron I do? We were a little, literally... yeah. <laughs> We were a little nearsighted on the whole thing, I think. Just a little <laughs> bit. Didn't occur to me that we stole their shit. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and guys, that's literally what Scientologists are told to ask themselves in any given situation. What would LRH do? What would Ron do? And uh, anyway, I was I mean, I, I I sort of imagine you going back there and being like, this is still a thing. You guys still exist. I did, you guys are still here. Mm -hmm. Like, really? Well, so Aaron, yeah. when I left like it was before so two things it was before any uh, any like big movement started happening with people like like getting out and speaking out and i also didn't have any uh i had no relations with anybody that i had contact with from my previous time in scientology so i had never decompressed or had a chance mm -hmm. to to really like vent out all of my frustrations or talk to somebody and have somebody like help me kind of process any of that stuff for years and years. So going back yeah. into it, it's funny when I arrived because I literally came from Afghanistan and I arrived there and I was in uniform and that was super intimidating for me because I'm like rolling up in my combat fatigues, like, and like, and they're like, Oh shit. Like not really sure what to do with that because I think they're, you know, the OSA types that I had seen at the time, they're used to dealing with like people coming up there in bad standing with Scientology, but probably not many of them show up in, in uniform. And I didn't do that. 
I was just, that was the only clothes I had. Like I'm, I'm arriving. I'm like, I need to go buy some jeans and a shirt. Like, but anyway, I went straight to the hospital and that's what they ended up with. So how did, how did it come to be that they even let you come and see her knowing that you were declared? I was, she was in the hospital. She was in the ICU. Like, did they, they know you were coming? Did they know you were coming? Um, they did not until I showed up. So when I got, like I arrived. So, but this is the thing. If a family or if a loved one is in the hospital, the loved one is the only one that can say, I don't want to see you. And she's post-op. She can't say that one way or the other. So I, I, I'm not going to say that I played the military card, like the whole thank you for your service thing. But I like everyone was like, oh, your mom, let me help you. Yeah, she's up here. I was just like, hey, I just got off the boat. Somebody help me out. And they were able to get me up there and get her there. And the medical officers and stuff are there. And I knew the person. It, her name is uh, Adrian Pavlov. She's the, uh, it was Adrian Amberon when she was up at the end base. Um, but she was the medical liaison officer for PAC. And she was there. I knew Adrian. And I told her straight up, I'm like, look, Adrian, I'm not here to cause any problems. I'm here to see my mom. She just had heart surgery. <laughs> And uh, at that time, she was like, oh, we need to get you in contact with, you know, um, Marion Powell and Mike Sutter. And, you know, they're going to need to talk to you. And I'm like, OK, whatever. I'll talk to them. And I ended up talking to them when I was out there. Nothing fruitful came of that conversation because they they can't have a straight conversation to save their lives. But um, but I was able to see her while she was there. And I did give her that burner phone. She kept it and she didn't tell anybody she had it. <clears throat> so um, kudos to your mom. So when that. I. Yeah. So when I was, well, they ended up getting it from her and I'll, I'll explain what happened. So, um, a couple months later she calls me and she's like, Mike, I have really great news. And I'm like, what? She's like, Hey, I now qualify for the supplemental healthcare coverage. So the Medi-Cal I'm like, cause they took all great. our, cause they took all our money. You see, you already got to the punchline too soon. <laughs> You're so good at this game. <laughs> yeah. So she tells me that no, she had given like, all this great money. News, Mike. They took all my money, yeah. so I qualify. She's like, yeah, oh, I qualify. Man. I'm getting auditing. Like, it's such good news. I just had to give them $10,000 as a CRG member in order to start getting some auditing. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. You were made to pay for that? I'm like, mom, that is, I'm like, you shouldn't have to pay for any of that. They should be giving you auditing. So I wrote a very nasty letter to Mike Sutter um, expressing my, um, it wasn't, it's not fit for YouTube, what I wrote, but um, expressing like he shouldn't do that to people like, hey, the, your, your criminal ass organization is stealing from an old woman. And um, they freaked out, like, how the hell does he know that that happened? So then they went back, they interrogated Rosemary. They found out that she had that cell phone and she called me. They took the cell phone away from her. Can I ask you a quick question? My, my, I thought mm -hmm. Mike Sutter was always like an, an int base person. How are you talking well, to Mike well, Sutter? Is. So... Anyone who is uh, Dave Miscavige adjacent is going to fall out of favor with him if they get too much power. That's probably mm -hmm. been talked about. Like you can't ever, if you're ever doing good at some point, he's going to drag you down. So anyway, whether Mike Sutter and Mariam Powell, they have been, they were, um, they were two people that have been like in RTC forever. And all of these people had blown the end base, the Mark Headleys of the world being, you know, the prime example of that Sterling, you know, Justin, um, all of these people were out there and their job was like, you guys were going to go down to pack on a mission. You're going to work out of OSA, work out of the, uh, Hollywood guarantee building down there on Holly, uh, on Hollywood Boulevard. And you're going to contact each one of these people and get them all basically back under control. This is where you had all of the like little spies back and forth where the Eric Geisler, Wolfie Franks, like people telling on each other and Osa was running them. The people that were pulling those strings were Mike Sutter and Marion Powell. They were on the mission to fix all of that. Got him. So, and I kind of arrived back in the middle of that. So they tried to kind of rope me into it as well. Um, and it, it, they didn't get anywhere with me on it. So, but when this was found out, they took that phone away from her and they had her write up a whole report on everything she knew about me, what I'm doing, where I'm at, why I did what I said and all this. And I still have a copy of that because she kept it and what she exactly wrote. And as Mike Sutter's handwriting all over it, having her change certain wording, remove this paragraph, write this in, like even changing their internal documents so that it's like, oh, she's saying this shit and it's a lot of it's illegal. Let's edit this out so that we can even have it internally. Wow. Um, 
and she has the edit that she had to go back and fix and give the finished copy, but she still has the one that was unacceptable to turn in that she just kept. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? Um, so to see that's crazy. So me bitching, they stopped trying to take money from her in 2012. She also fell out of contact with me and I really didn't have any contact with her until 2021, which is when she was hospitalized. We thought she had a stroke and was about to die. So I fell out of contact with her again for like a nine year period where she would not write to us. She would not be in contact with me. We weren't able to get in to see her every once in a while. I'd hear from one of her brothers and sisters like, Hey, you hear anything from my mom? Well, we didn't hear from her this year, but we think she's okay. I guess no news means she's still alive was kind of like everyone's viewpoint of what's going on there. So what I didn't know until later, what we found out about once we got her out and were able to pull apart all of her financials is so after the point of uh, Mike Sutter, she was then put on the PTSSP course yet again, because she caught, she talked to a big, bad suppressive person, her son, and he was all upset about her paying for auditing as a CRG member. And let's get her through this course again so we can, you know, reindoctrinate her again and again and again. Um, she then uh, continued to uh, accumulate social security money um, and a very small pension that she had from AT&T prior to being in the Sea Org. Uh, and by 2014 had about $25,000 just sitting in her account. Sea Org members have very little financial need in that they live communally and work 24 seven, 365. So it's not like you go on vacations. You don't, you don't need a vehicle. You don't have any additional needs because all you do is work for the organization. Um, normally you'd expect a person in their elderly years to have a 401k, have assets, have a house, have a mortgage, and then they have these things they accumulate through their life. Um, but that's very odd for a Sea Org member to, it's, to have any sort of assets. Um, so she had about $25,000. So 2014, she was then um, working on her job. This was on a Tuesday, I believe, um, when we looked at the, the financials of when all this happened and she kind of explained to me all the specifics. She was approached by uh, one of the International Association of Scientologist Registrars, uh, a guy named, uh, what was his name, Ted Bregan? Bregan? Mm. You might know uh, who that is. See the short squat dude. I've never seen him before. Um, <clears throat> apparently, he's one of the senior regs for the IS, Ted Bregan, mm. and also the commanding officer of AOLA, uh, a lady named Salaj Padva. If you know her, hmm. it's a strange what name. I think she's what, French. What year would this have been? Um, November 2014. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Yeah, way after I was at AOLA. Okay. Yeah. So you were already gone. <clears throat> okay. Or out of AOLA. Yeah. So. So they pull her into a room and they hard sell reg her saying, we need you to donate to the IAS. And it is absolutely vital that we get money from you for the IAS. I guess the IAS uh, like collection stats were down. And what happens with all your mail as a CRG member when it arrives from outside institutions like your bank? It's open. It gets opened. Yeah. And read. And read. So they were doing that with her bank statements. So they knew how much money she had in her account. They came in there and they would not take no for an answer until she gave them all of that money. They took it out of her account in 5K increments over the course of about two or three days and had all that money collected. So she was penniless by Thursday at two o'clock. She wow. just wanted out of that room after like they were keeping her in there. They were trying to love bomber for a while, beating their fists on the desk. Talk, we need to get rid of the SPs and you're going to help like all this crap that they do for trying to get people to donate they do it with the public a lot where they're trying to just get on with their services and they got to go through the IAS office well the IAS office came to her here and they got all of that money so now she had no money um a month later december 2014 she was working in aola still as the extension core supervisor just trying to get her stats uh, up before thursday at two o'clock her direct supervisor was a guy named Carlos Colon. He was the public officer. And I think, um, so Carlos came to Rosemary and said, hey, I need you to go up to LA Day that you're going to talk to some of the regs and they're going to see if we can actually get you some auditing and get you back on the bridge. And she's like, okay. She kind of knew that they wanted money. She's like, I don't have any money left. And he, she's like, hey, just uh, the guy's like, go up there, talk, talk to them, see what they got to say. And, you know, just, I guess it's like, all the registrars and Div 6 and, you know, 
at AOLA is kind of in contact with all of the regs at both American Sand Hill Organization, uh, the LA Day, which is the, the the class five org right there. All of them are in cahoots with each other. So some reg called another reg, now they're sending a little old lady up to LA Day. She arrives there and a team of three regs, um, she was able to identify them as Sherry Bloomfield, Jackson Walker, and Joel Foss are all trying to sit down with her and sell her the bridge. Granted, before she got into the Sea Org, she was grade four as uh, in, in Colorado before we arrived. She had done no training, but she at least got auditing up to grade four. Well, they needed to start her back at the very beginning because we have new shit that we need to sell people. So they were trying to sell her the whole bridge. And she's like, I don't know what to tell you. I don't have any money. She's like, I'd love to get auditing, but I'm, I can't pay for it. And they're like, well, we need to work something out. She's like, I don't know what to say. So they they had her in the conference room. They had a guy named Jason Hemphill, who was the commanding officer of PAC base. He's like, you know, wearing, you know, commander stripes or something, comes in and is trying to reg her for it as well. And she's at the she's at the same point. Like, I don't know what to tell you. So she goes back to post. The next day she gets a call from the registrars and said, Hey, we worked it out. We got it. We got we were able to figure out money. You can get your auditing. She's like, I don't understand. She's like, they're like, look, we, there was another Sea Org member. We put it on his credit card for you to get the auditing. And it was a gentleman by the name of Kareel Changahuli. And they, Kareel Changahuli had a, a very, uh, had a father that was outside of the Sea Org. that was very wealthy. He had a credit limit, apparently up to $50,000 on a credit card. And they charged every bit of that for auditing for Rosemary. And Kareel knew nothing about it when it happened. They just had his credit card information and charged it and told Kirill to go talk to Rosemary and get her his money if he wanted it. So oh both God. of them were like, they did, he, she didn't even know who Kirill Changahuli was before this happened. And now she's stuck now having to pay him off. So the only money she gets in is her social security payments and this little pension and then her $50 a week. She would, she had also over the course of time gotten a little inheritance from um, my grandmother when she passed. But now she's taking all the money that she's making, including her Sea Org pay, to pay back staff members whose credit cards were charged up for her to get auditing. But wait, there's more. This only this didn't just happen with Kirill Changahuli. It happened with about four other people. Mickey Estrada, Suzanne Justice, another lady uh, by the name of uh, Tina Nuchki. Um, all of them had credit cards that were charged for auditing for Rosemary. And she then had to pay them back directly. She's chipping away at this thing over years and years and years. She's She has a little black book, which she kept, and I have right here, of every single transaction that she had made. We've gotten all of her, you know, all of her bank statements and verified every line of this stuff. She's very meticulous about it. I have to give her credit for it. And she's paying and paying and paying and paying on this. At the time, she never really had credit card debt before this. She didn't understand compound interest and things of this nature. She's just keeping track of the bottom line of what she owed. It's not like she had a big pot of money to just pay it off all at once. She's just getting her social security payments that are going to pay these people off. She gets to what she thinks is done and goes to Kirill and he's like, there's still thousands of dollars left on here because of all the interest. And she had to then pay the interest off as well. Um, at a certain point, I think the staff members were getting shitty about people just running up their credit cards for other staff to get auditing, and they started to complain. So they changed their tactic on what to do. What they did now is the regs show she finished it um, at LA Day with all of that of you know probably close to seventy thousand dollars of um, funds that were taken from other staff members. Over credit like how many how many out. years is she taken to pay off this credit card debt? The, the, the original the original round. The original round. <clears throat> so some I of mean, it, so total, like it, some of it was paid off over the course of about seven years. So if mm. you if you extrapolate out interest on credit cards over that level of time, and then what I'll get into next is she had to kind of move some of that money around. Mm. So what they started doing, the registrars has started opening up credit cards in her name without her authorization. They have all your information on your life history forms, your mother's maiden name, your social security number, your date of birth, everything that they that would ever be known about you. These registrars have access to that. It's not just like HR that has it, though. They can anyone can go in there and, you know, do this stuff if the organization needs their money. And they started opening up credit cards in her name. 
And we have the credit card applications we were able to get. So this is what one would look like. Uh, total annual income, $65,000. Owns a home, free and clear. Zero debt. She's a great credit risk at this point. If you're a creditor, you're going to give her a $20,000 credit card, which is exactly what would happen. Then there'd be other ones. And every time they do a credit application, the amount of money that she makes annually goes up. The amount of, of uh, liability she has would go down and they'd keep getting credit cards in her name to the tune of, again, tens and tens of thousands of dollars per credit card. And then and without, and without, charge, her, without her permission, right? She would find out about it when she would get the statement. She's like, what the hell is this? And she's like, I right. didn't know that I had a Navy Federal Credit Union card, let alone three of them. Right. And some of them didn't even have her correct name on them. You know how you're like, hey, how does she say her name? Well, that was what the Reg did too. Rosemary, one word, the Reg fucked up and he just made it Rose M as in Mary is her middle name, Chickwalk, and she gets it in, it's Rose M. And she's like, what? And she's like, where did this come from? And then she's like, oh, they're like, sorry. When she goes to the ethics section or her seniors or all that, the people, because they're all in on it, she would report this stuff and they'll be like, hey, you're going to have to pay for it now. It's for auditing for you. You know, it's, it's what you're going to have to do. This is what's even more insidious about the way that they would do this stuff. The credit card companies are only offering that credit because they think that they can recoup the amount based off of the credit application and make money off of you. They also, when you, if you die, so if an elderly CERG member passes away, they, the banks are going to expect based off of your credit application, you own a home free and clear. They can basically take and liquidate that home and get their money back as a creditor. Like when a person dies, their credit card debt doesn't die with them. The credit card debt only dies with them if they have no assets. CIRG members have no assets, but the fact that these registrars were reporting assets that didn't exist, the credit the creditors would issue credit cards because they thought that they could get their money back. Right. Their example. So this is not unique to my mother. Like th this was being done on dozens. Like uh, she has a list of at least three dozen other elderly CIRG members just in the Los Angeles area that she personally knew that have similar situations to hers. There was one lady that she uh, was right next to. Her name was Rose Marie Paquette. And Rose Marie, you I know probably Rose know her. Marie. I know her very well. So Rose Marie and my mom, Rosemary, were roommates in room 206. They, and their names are very similar. And Rose Marie had... This is probably in about 20, and, and I'm probably getting the, the year wrong, uh, the years wrong, somewhere between 2018, 2019, Rosemary passed away. She died. And because her name was so similar to Rosemary's, Rosemary ended up getting some of her mail. It was one of the statements from Navy Federal Credit Union. So Rosemary got it. She opened it up. And after she opened it, she's like, oh, wait, this is Rosemary's. It's not mine. The amount that Rosemary Paquette still owed on that particular credit card that had accidentally made it into uh, the wrong basket and what ended up with my mom's stuff was over $12,000 of credit card debt for auditing that had been charged for her that that credit uh, that creditor is never going to see again. And so, um, so, uh, see, uh, what's interesting about Rosemary Paquette is I knew her way before she was ever in the Sea Org. She joined the Sea Org very, very late in life. But even then, it was probably around 2003, 2004. So, so she'd already been in the Sea Org for a long time by relatively mm -hmm. Sea, relative Sea Org standards. And, and she was very old to begin with. Right. So they're making her pay the idea. I think public Scientologists, public Scientologists would be outraged at the idea that these elderly Sea Org members are not allowed to be, are not being given auditing unless they pay for it on credit cards. This, this is the kind of thing. Yes. The FBI cares. Yes. The state attorneys care. Public Scientologists would be outraged. That's why th another reason this is so important to talk about this. So these are the people that are at your beck and call when you go in there as a public Scientologist to service you. They, these elderly people, there's no one that helps them do their laundry. That, that nice blazer, that my mom's wearing in that picture that's laundered by the organization the actual coat she's wearing they want everyone to look good so they're going to dry clean their coats but all of their undergarments all of her shirts all of her socks she has to go to the same laundry room that everybody else has to go through on the other side of the vru over by the pack mill those old people can't walk there 
there were months and months where these old people were not being taken care of and no one would help them do their laundry. And they would either just wash their stuff in the sink or just wouldn't wash their clothes. Wow. Like this is, they, 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 they go back and forth, uh, trying to go to and from meals, to and from musters, just like everybody else. They, they usually, they might need a walker and might not have it because it would look bad if they had a person with a walker walking around one of the organizations. So most of the time they don't let those people be around, but they're moving through the tunnel system under there. And I, and I, I was kind of jokingly, uh, talking with Mike and uh, Claire about the tunnel system. I'm like, this isn't some QAnon thing, like no shit under that Cedars of Lebanon complex. There's a tunnel system that connects all those organizations. And that's how the staff members move around. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the old people are trying to go through there, trying to walk up the steps, make it to a meal. That's a 30 minute meal break, make it back for their musters. They're working them very long hours and there's no plan to, there's not a plan in the C organization. Like they say, you sign this billion year contract there. The, the perfect storm for a C organization member would be work until the day you die and drop dead on post. And that would be success for them because the organization then isn't out anything and they think that they've done as good as they can, but they're living like crap. They're not being well taken care of. And if they do need additional medical care, they're usually not getting it. These people should be in their you know, later years in life, being able to retire, being able to relax. They, they don't have time to relax with each other. That's not like they're having a chance to sit around and play cards or write poetry or watch the game show network or whatever it is that they like to do. They will work them until they die. There's some stories um, that, so I was trying to call me, sorry about that. Um, there was one story that she told me where there was a woman, um, that she has dementia and this, uh, this lady, like she can't even take care of herself properly, but she gets about $500 a month from her late husband. And this isn't, this isn't Eunice, is it? It's not, okay. it's, uh, it's another lady. I just, I don't have the list of all of them up in front of me, but she worked in ALA and um, she would get this $500 a month. And like clockwork, the IRS regs would swing by every, t every time they knew her payment was coming in and have her sign it over to the IS. Boop, just take it right off the top. And I know me bringing all this up, what is Scientology going to be doing after they see these videos from yesterday into today? They're going to be scrambling their asses off to try to like, Oh my gosh, we need to start, you know, handle the flap of these old people. Like, because these SPs are talking about it. Good. Take care of these old people. That's why I'm doing this. I'm not doing it for my benefit. I have way better shit to do with my time than to try to like fix Scientology, but this is so bad. I'm going to make time because I'm going to expose what I found out about because it is shameful to in. So all of these different schemes, and th this was the same scheme in all of the organizations there. It was LA day. It was uh, American Sand Hill Organization, ASHO, and then the Advanced Organization of Los Angeles. All the way down, every single one of those regs were taking money from her, running up her credit cards, opening credit cards. She's she's just trying to pay them off. Like, oh my God, and here's another one. And it's she's frantic about it. And you can imagine if you have debilitating debt, anytime you have debt, it feels heavy. And it's like, okay, what am I going to do in order to make this? And that's like with a normal person that has the means to make money. If your only means to make money is your social security payment that's coming in and your $50 and all of that's going to it, and you have more debt that's coming in that you're not asking for. Can you imagine the level of anxiety and torment that that's creating on these people? It's, it's got to be overwhelming in addition to just the way that they live. Yeah. Unbelievable. So all told- and from the organization side, they're like, well, we don't care. She's going to die soon anyway. And then the debt will, it will be wiped out. Yeah. And because these people have uh, fraudulently applied for credit and it looks like the person did it, but you can do a credit application online. And that's what these regs do. They log in, they have all the person's information. They have your social security number, all that stuff. Click, 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 boop, approved. Either that or disapproved. And if it's disapproved, hmm, let's up this person's income a little bit. Add another 10 grand on top of this or, you know, the home's free and clear or whatever it is so that they can get the credit cards. Um, they're going to get them one way or the other. And then, so, so how did Scientology react to this? Because the same scheme they were doing on the public, they were doing it on the public and it was referred to as the chase wave. They had the public's credit card uh, numbers 
And Rosemary's told me these stories because she was right there in the public division right next to the chaplain's office. The majority of the people that are going into the chaplain are public that are bitching about the fact that their credit cards have been run and it hasn't been authorized. Yeah. Like dozens and dozens and dozens of people. When this was found out about, and I think it was what, Ken Moxon that found out about it and then reported it up and they, you know, like, hey, we need to like cover all this up and, you know, give the money back to these public and all that. They did that to the public. They didn't do that for their staff. They continued to harvest their staff for everything that they could as often as they could and yeah. probably have stopped doing it now because they're very aware that we are aware of this. Well, and it's one of the reasons that out. it's one of the reasons that the orgs have had so much money, uh, so much trouble making money these days is because, well, Scientology has been shrinking for decades and decades and decades, but the, the demand for income continues to go up. This, mm -hmm. this credit card fraud, this massive worldwide systemic intra-organizational credit card fraud, identity theft, bank fraud, wire fraud. This is how they were meeting the demand for income. But then it sort of got exposed and they had to they had to scale back and now they're not making any money anymore but guys yeah. so this is for the viewers when when people ask in the in the live chat in the q a is like oh what's going to take down scientology is it going to be david miscavige beating people up i go no, no no the feds don't give a shit about that this is the shit they care about scientology using this credit card um identity theft and credit card fraud scheme raised fraudulently hundreds of millions of dollars over like a five or six period oh, yeah. using this credit card fraud scheme. And it's all documented. That's the thing. It's all documented. That's what happens with finances. The feds know exactly where to look. The banks have all the records. Yeah, they do. This is, and you just have to ask for them. And when you're the yes. person who has the debt, it's super easy. Um, yes. So all told over through all these schemes of, extorting money from her when she's dying in bed for auditing directly, collecting money through hard sell for the IAS, um, running up other Sea Org members' credit cards and making her pay them back, running up credit cards on her directly or opening lines of credit in her name that she is then forced to pay back. They extorted from her over $163,000 over the course of a nine-year period. Whoa, that is, this is an el one elderly Sea Org member that is your extension core supervisor for the advanced organization of Los Angeles. I'm sure a lot of people know who she is. Yeah, She is not the only one. If you're over 65 and you're, oh, I know you got to do your thing. I'll keep talking. Um, if you're over 65 and you are receiving social security payments or you have any um, way of getting supplemental income for yourself that Scientology can find out about, they will 100% get it from their staff. Yeah. Period. Uh, real quick, let me show. Okay, there's a couple things that I want to share. Sure. On Mike's blog yesterday morning, uh, he posted a link to your the first part one of the chat that you guys had with him. And he named the people who were involved in this extortion and credit card fraud so and I'm, I'm putting this up here for all you under the radar scientologists if you yourself have had experiences with this credit card fraud with any of these people please message me at growing up in scientology at gmail.com so jason hemphill by the way i know him personally sandra cologne sheree bloomfield i know her personally uh jackson walker i thought i knew him but i think it's a different jackson that i knew uh, Joel Foss and uh, number let's, six let's, is uh Kerry Green, is the guy's Kerry name. Green. And by Kerry. the way, this information of oh, yeah. Terry Green, no, Kerry with a, a K, okay. I think, or C, whatever. This information was as Rosemary reported it over two years ago. So some of the information here is no longer accurate. But um, Emmett Bond, David Light, Carlos Colon, Josh Palmer. Juliana Palmer, Michael Kerner, Derek Myers. I know him personally. One of the stupidest people I've ever met. Um, Ted Bragan and Salaj Padva. Incredible. 
Um, and I also wanted to show once again, this was your mom during the time that they were extorting her over these years. Um, and tell everyone when this photo was taken. So this photo was taken um, shortly after we helped her escape. And we'll go into more details about that tomorrow. But this is a recent photo. Um, she's very comfortable now. So good news story for everybody. And it's a, you know, a little bit of a, you know, kind of preamble to what uh, the story is going to be that I tell tomorrow. She is a, she is very safe. She is in a very high quality care facility. Um, she is comfortable. She has a lot of uh, life enrichment opportunities that she has there. Um, she's able to socialize and uh, she has great food. She has a great room. She has her little walker that she rolls around with and she's just getting after it. She has as much supplemental oxygen as she can ever want um, with her at all times, which is something she obviously needed. And um, <clears throat> so and and I'll, and I'll find another picture that I can share with her tomorrow uh, that we go over or share of her tomorrow that um, I can show some people how she's how she's looking today. Uh, but she's very, very happy. She's been able to reunite with me. Um, she's gotten to know her grandchildren that she barely even knew about, uh, let alone never really met. She now has a relationship with them. And um, this is this is something I never thought I'd have the opportunity to have in my life again, which is a connection with my mother. And the uh, it it would have um, it would have continued to break my heart if it was left the way that it was. But this is a very uh, good news story, which is in very, very large part to a lot of help that I received from the Aftermath Foundation and some very close personal friends in LA that helped me get her out of there. So this is, it's not just a catchphrase. I know everyone's very familiar with uh, the Sergio Belinsky documentary. <clears throat> the Aftermath is doing a lot to help a lot of people and Rosemary is one of those. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, she would probably be dead today if it wasn't for the help that we received. And now she's very alive, doing very well, and uh, in a safe place. Yeah. Now, you would think that once Mike and some other friends helped his mom escape from the place that she was being kept and, you know, moved her all the way across the country to reunite with family, you'd think Scientology would be like, cut our losses, don't bother those people anymore. And yet Scientology PIs have tried to infiltrate the place where your mom is. They've th these yep. guys can't fucking help themselves. It um, it would be too like if they showed a shred of actual decency. Most of their problems would go away. <clears throat> they can't help but treat people like crap. And um, <coughs> so sorry, I've been talking a lot and it's emotional for me. I apologize. But um, when you're a hammer, everything is a nail, and that's what Scientology is. They they can't they can't get out of their own way with situations like this. I had no intention of ever having anything to do with Scientology ever again. I am a professional in the field that I am very successful in. I am going to I do very well for myself, and I'm raising a beautiful family. But when I found out. <clears throat> what was going on with my mother. And I was hugely unaware of it because I thought that she was involved in the church that she loved. It wasn't for me, but if you're a consenting adult and you want to do something, by all means do so. The way that Scientology has taken advantage of children, of young adults that are under the age of 18 and then of its elderly people is unbelievably bad. And that is the stuff that is absolutely <clears throat> actionable and that they need to be held accountable for. There's a lot of other crimes that are very worth talking about, but when you're talking about abuse of the populations of society that are dependent on you for their care and help, that is inexcusable. Yeah. And as a senior citizen under your care, when you then take advantage of people this badly, it's illegal. Yeah. And it is horrible. So can Scientology they they can't get out of their own way it's um and uh she does have legal representation now we'll go into more detail on that tomorrow um we have you know got her into a very safe place but the reason i'm continuing to speak out and share this story 
is because I want to support the Aftermath Foundation, but more so, there are a lot of people still back there in the C organization who believe they are stuck there or believe they are there just waiting for it to get better that are being very badly taken advantage of. Yeah. And, and that you know, needs... people ask how Scientology gets away with abusing its staff or not. No, that's not what they ask specifically, but um, there, there's a lot of religious protections that are in place that protect Scientology because its workforce is considered religious volunteers. And yet mm -hmm. those protections do not apply. Those same protections do not apply to senior citizens. You cannot get away with abusing elders the same. You cannot get away with treating elders the way Scientology does, treats their non-elder staff. So these financial crimes, when committed against the elderly in Scientology, are more actionable, are even more actionable than the same financial crimes committed against those who are not yet legally um, 65 or older. And, Correct. Um, yeah. So guys, real quick, the Aftermath Foundation has a new website. Uh, you can find it at theaftermathfoundation.org if uh, you want to support the foundation. And Mike, there are a few questions specifically for you. I know you can't talk a lot about your military stuff. So there's some of these questions you can just say if you can't answer some of the questions or okay. yeah, I'm happy or whatever. To. Um, Anna Anderson asks, what unit were you in? What does OIF mean? Uh, mean? Operation Enduring Freedom. So that would be oh. the campaign that was uh, in effect uh, during the years um, in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. So it's there's different um, military um, operations that go throughout various different years. Um, so I, I'm i in the Army. I was uh, on my deployments. I was in the 10th Mountain Division, and I was also in the 101st Airborne. Mm. What does the 25th ID Striker Brigade mean? Uh, that's just uh, so all the all the different units have different designations. Um, they don't, it's not, they're not necessarily sequential. A lot of these things are historic in nature. So the 25th doesn't necessarily imply that there's 24 before it. It's just, that is the designation for that unit. And they're, you know, a striker is just a type of, um, it's a kind of a military transport vehicle um, that is uh, slightly up armored. So, yeah. What does ID mean? Uh, infantry division. Oh, got it, got it, got it. <laughs> Sorry. I know two different languages. One is, you know, military vernacular and the other one is Scientology. So it's like <laughs> I'm trying to translate the two of those into like regular English right now. And I'm like, you know, struggling back and forth pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> Mama Duke says, tell your mom she is loved and everyone is here for her. Does she watch a lot of SPTV? She does. Um, she also watches a lot of the Game Show Network. <laughs> um, she's a big fan of people puzzler and she also loves her some cash cab <laughs> <laughs> cash cab is still on the air. Uh, it's probably all the reruns, but I mean, it's not like she was watching them in the Sea Org. So it's like the game shows are on. I mean, she'll spend the whole Sunday watching cash cab. She just loves it. Oh, she's I like used to, to guess love that show. <laughs> uh, okay. Pat Shore says, um, question is law enforcement following up or are they sweeping it under the rug? So this is my understanding of how it works with um, thing, uh, agencies like the FBI. The FBI is an investigator. They investigate things. So the FBI can investigate things all day long. They have a lot of information. They will then come up with their findings. And it is then up to the district attorneys that are in place in order to pursue federal motions one way or the other. So all I can say from our perspective is we have provided the information that we have. And I know that when we talk to the people at the FBI, you know how we're having to kind of explain like, well, this is what it means in Scientology. And this is what these, they need none of that explanation. These FBI agents speak Scientologies like they were in Scientology. They understand it like on a creepy level, like you don't need to break it down for them. When you start doing that, they're like, I, I understand how all that works, but explain to me this. And you're like, oh yeah, you're totally tracking. So it's not, there's not inaction going on. They're not ignoring it from my perspective. I just don't know. I think that there's a lot of, there's, there's probably political things in play that I, I couldn't even begin to understand. And then I think the people that are going to have to bring some case forward, it's probably going to be their career for the rest of their life when they do it. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm not bad mouthing anybody in those positions. I do hope that they bring something forward 
Um, and I know that they are actively, they, they were very quick to get our information and have been very uh, specific about the information that they wanted. And it was very interesting to be questioned by them. Yeah. You know, Scientology uses its tax exempt money to buy some of the most well-connected and influential lobbyists and retired judges. And this is and the that's in the business. And this is the reason why, because they are very, very afraid at what various states attorneys can and likely will do as the evidence um, as the evidence continues to mount and mount and cases get stronger. And this is why, you know, when I talk about Scientology being prosecuted under RICO statutes, you you super internet sleuths out there, you tell me, does, you, does this shit sound like RICO shit? This kind of so, credit card fraud that we're talking about was not just happening in Los Angeles. It was happening in every Sea Org base around the world. Right. And, and, the, and the orgs and, this, and the orgs. Absolutely. And I'm bringing forth specifics of one person. It's because that's the information that I have. Um, so, and it's important just to frame this with some of these specifics so that it takes it out of the realm of just, you know, sweeping generalities about these things happening. When I can get into specifics about what one person that I've documented down to every penny was subjected to, and then you extrapolate that out over a lot of other people, it starts to make a whole lot more sense. Um, yeah, one thing that is going to also change the narrative is people that are sharing their story about what went on. So when there is meaningful information to get it out there and change the public perception of what is going on and what is acceptable, there it's going to start to, pressure is going to build to the point where lawmakers, judges, um, law enforcement will be pressured into like, hey, this is the public is drifting in this direction. And that's my understanding of the term public policy. Like what is the public need going most towards in terms of some of these very ambiguous things when you start getting into what's acceptable and what's not acceptable? Like what's acceptable today is very different from what was acceptable 80 years ago. Public policy is one of the things that we can shape by things by a by us sharing information that we have if we don't share the information then nothing will change so that's why i'm sharing it i personally i could care less about scientology if it continues to exist or not if it is going to exist i'd prefer that they stop hurting people because there's still a lot of people i care very much about that are still back there um and they should change like they they should either change what they're doing so that they're they're they are they are for the public good or they should be held accountable for the things that they do wrong that's the way i feel about it yeah. Um, here's a question. Brian asks, how angry is your mom? Her reflections? What do you think about this? <clears throat> She's not an inherently angry person. Um, I think the, the most anger I've seen with her was when she realized how full of shit Hubbard was. And that light switch clicked from a believer to a non-believer because I think along with that, the floodgate opened that everything she had been subjected to was a waste and her life was wasted. So there were a lot of very intense emotions connected with that, a lot of internal guilt that she dealt with and a lot of anger, probably almost angry at herself, which I've tried to be there and talk to her and help her through all these things. But she is she's a very loving person, like anyone who knows her, they'll, she's one of the nicest people that she'll ever meet. And um, Claire and Mike both know her personally. And uh, they, they talked about her and she really is. I mean, she's literally like, she would be everybody's mom. Like she's just one of these people that is, she's happy to help people. And she's, so she's always been on these, you know, public service lines or before that on the executive service lines. And it made her happy to help other people. So, but when she realized that Hubbard was a con artist and really for, and we'll get into that in the video tomorrow, but a lot of the documentaries that are out there, like going clear and the work that Mike and Leah did, that's helping a lot of people, um, change their perception of the things that they thought that they could believe in versus what they actually are realizing. Like, Oh my God, I was duped and I yeah. wasted my life. We can get more money. We can, you know, replace physical things. You won't get more time. And once your health is gone, it's gone. Those are the yeah. things you can never get back. Yeah. Um, okay, here's one. Caroline says, Mike, can you sue Scientology, please? <laughs> Thank you for Any your comment. 
anything you want to say or just uh think I, I um, to. Well, um there's a lot that's going on with that i'm not going to get into the specifics of it but i can just tell you she has excellent legal representation there you go all right everyone well this was a good chat this was a good was. chat i know, you know. it's a heavy subject but um i think yeah. it's important we did it absolutely uh and let me see it's also why i'm so excited that you've got your channel mike brown if you can't find him under mike brown because it's kind of a common name search at mike brown 101 all one word on youtube and you'll definitely find it you mentioned sterling before you and sterling are good friends right we are very good friends we'll have to get on and yuck it up one of these nights he's, By the way, this, he's this, a little this, bit more a sunshine than i am i'm kind of like a little bit moodier so i you know sometimes he's a little bit overly happy you know so i'll try to i'll try to you know drag the conversation down a little bit now and then if we ever get on together. this this mythical justin tompkins have you ever seen this guy in real life i hear he's a, he's a creature of the of the night of the woods of the forest never never seeing sun sunlight have you have you met him before i have met him before he is a force to be reckoned with um but actually he was directly involved in um helping me get my mother out when oh, wow. we did get her out yeah so he was one of the the people that went into the facility with me and were able to get her out um him and one other friend so we'll tell that story some tomorrow on uh on mike and claire's um live that they're going to do at 7 p.m eastern awesome well one of these times me you and uh sterling i'm going to speak with sterling later this afternoon but we'll have to do a little group chat for sure <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you for hanging out with us this afternoon. Thank you, as always, to everyone who watches until the very end. And we'll talk to you soon. Okay, if you want to see my rock and roll songs, click right on this guitar. And if you want to see a, a different one of my videos, uh, oh, yeah, then you could click right inside here. If you have subscribed or not, subscribe right here. Bye.